um, in like two minutes. <laughs> so um, we have a very interesting agenda today, although I have to say, I think we have usually very interesting agendas. Um, we have Astrid, who's my deputy, who you all know, who just is fresh back from her Haiti mission. Um, and that has is one of the scale ups um, as per the ERC. And um, then we have an, a long overdue uh, presentation by Christina Palacios and um, also uh, looking at what has been the response in Turkey. And I say overdue because with the whole situation of the earthquake, I don't think we really did justice to presenting everything that was happening um, in the different locations. So we're looking forward to that presentation. Um, and then our last one is with um, Fulvia from uh, Whole of Syria, who's gonna be talking about the framework that is around the adolescents. I think if you remember the whole of Syria started off some years ago with an adolescent strategy. And I think at the global level, we've been increasing the amount we talk about adolescent girls being left behind and needing to ensure that they have a space to raise their voices and it can impact policies. And it is part of our GBV AOR strategy at the global level. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing about this framework that's been developed. So we're going to start off with the mission um, from Haiti. And I just want to say a thank you to all of you who have joined. Um, I think 47, which is a bit lower than we often have, considering we're in the middle of summer and there's a number of people who take their holiday break at this time of the year. So I want to just thank all of you for joining because I, I do, we know that the scale ups in the humanitarian emergencies continue without a holiday. So I appreciate the, the dedication of all of you to join this call. Um, over to you, Astrid. I thank you, Jennifer. So uh, maybe before I start, I want to say this, it's, I'm gonna update you on the Global Cluster Coordinators mission to Haiti. There will be a formal, mission report and briefings and follow up from the G from that side, like from the whole delegation or participation or the mission. So today I really want to focus on, on the, the GBV side of things. So it's a more informal update. It doesn't talk about all the recommendations that came out of the mission. So um, in the mission, we had Marina, who's the Global Cluster Coordinator Chair uh, in Ocha. There was health. Uh, protection and and then myself and it was just one week early July. I added on the slide to show you a bit the sense when we arrived in the country because uh, the Secretary General had been to Haiti or I think he finalized on the Saturday or Sunday and we came in kind of on the Monday um, and in, so in the background of the mission was his request and the, the discussions that were going to take place in the Security Council around whether there would be a deployment of a robust international force. So that was in the background. To be honest, I haven't heard, except that it has been discussed. I know that um, you know, the HC in Haiti was very optimistic that it would happen. Um, it's been on the agenda for a while, but it's very unclear if it's going to happen. But I mention it here because it shows some of the politics of the, and especially the, the lack of security um, and why it's so difficult to get a really good response in Haiti for the colleagues. Shiva? So, so briefly, this was the TUR for the mission. So we were there for five days. Um, it was at the request of the HC and the HCT. And the goal of the mission was for us to look together at the overall coordination and all the sectors. Uh, meeting with the different stakeholders to look at the coordination structure, um, what that looked like at the national, subnational level, uh, understanding the challenges faced by the intercluster, uh, discussing tools and ways to improve coordination and analysis, and also discussions with the cluster lead agencies on capacity strengthening and working with the government, as well as 
um, one to one or or the capacity meetings we had with our own sectors. Um, so if there will be a report more formally on that coming out later that we can share, but uh, today we'll focus on the GBV side of things. Uh, so what was very clear uh, is that Haiti is a protection crisis. Um, actually, 80% of the city of Port-au-Prince, the capital, is under the control of gangs. Um, the level of kidnappings, killings, and sexual violence is very high, and it's well documented by UNDSS, by the government, by different parts. It means that there are several... The, the, the city is divided into several kind of areas of control so that the population and the humanitarian actors need to know exactly in what part of the city they are and, they, and how to, or if it's possible at all, to, to go into the next uh, enclave. So you have the, the population uh, in the country having uh, raised um, um, barriers or, or things to block access at night from the gangs into their neighborhoods. So, and in addition to the security situations, there's a high level of food insecurity. Um, and then there is all the pre-existing GBV that uh, is taking place across the country due to economic collapse and other reasons. And then as well, as you're aware, Haiti um, has uh, lived through a, a number of crises, and we're talking about the earthquake going back to 2010. There was another earthquake just a year ago, smaller. We're now waiting for the hurricane season around the corner, and they're they're still struggling with cholera, although it's going better. So it's it's a it's a situation where we've had a lot of development actors, and and the focus of the GBV coordination for, over the years was more about preparedness and development. And now we're trying to move into that scale up uh, emergency. Uh, so most of the response is taking place right now in Port-au-Prince, the capital, where actually um, IDPs have moved, have been forced to move uh, by the gangs and the violence of the gangs uh, between different parts of the city. Uh, it means most of the those fleeing, most of the IDPs are living within host communities, but you also have a number of informal settlements. The government is not allowing uh, or doesn't want to recognize any formal IDP sites. Uh, we visited one informal settlement where there were around 7,000 people at night. Um, and it was the first visit that had taken place by... Um, at least the, the the UN actors or the agencies that were there that day. And it was a local organization that managed the access and security, but it was the first visit. And the only, when we talked to the committee that was also partly affiliated with a gang managing that area, they were saying the only thing that they were receiving was water. And you could see people coming with water, um, you know, with cans to fill up with water. But it was it was dismal, and there was no you know no floors, no no tents. Just um, it was more like a slum. I think people are sitting when they're sleeping, basically, and there's no uh, services whatsoever. Um, the the other thing that is on the horizon is also elections in terms of risks. We don't know if there will be elections. There's talk of elections. Uh, while we were there was the two-year anniversary of the assassination of the president. Um, and then in terms of services and humanitarian, um, the, the, the public hospitals and health services and the justice systems are at the brink of collapse or more or less non-existent in terms of justice and safety. Um, police does not have access to, to most of the gang areas, for example. Um, and the hospitals are uh, under enormous stress. We visited one hospital in the capital, or I did not, Marina and part of the other parts of the mission did. Um, and it was a catchment area for three uh, gang areas. And they, they discovered that a patient had been taken out um, 
of the hospital by gang, armed gang members some weeks before. And the, there was a lack of fuel, there's no electricity, there's no clean water. And the staff are also struggling uh, in terms of safety with all the patients and families and, and frustration about what they can't offer. So for the public hospitals, there's a lot to be done. And then uh, again, because of the security and the gangs, there's a, there's a lack of access to populations. And then there's a lack of access for the populations to the services because they need to travel at night, because they need to find out in what area of the city it is, et cetera. So it's a very difficult area uh, context in providing services. Shiva? In terms of the coordination, uh, which is uh, why we were there. Uh, so there was a three months humanitarian scale up declared in April. While we were there, the HCT discussed that they wanted to have another uh, extension and whether it would be three months or six months. I've understood afterwards that apparently for scale ups, you can only ask for three months, but that's something they wanted to also discuss um, with the government and uh, uh, we're hoping that there will be an extension. It would really make sense because it felt like it's only now that after three months that the response has started to become more uh, sustainable or that capacities have come together uh, in order to, to move things. Um, the clusters have been activated. There. So there was GBV uh, coordination going back several years. Uh, the current... Um, We've had over the past months, the, the former GBV coordinator in one of the regions, uh, Christian Vovi, who used to be the coordinator in Burundi and has a lot of experience. He's been double hatting as coordinator and managing the humanitarian programs of, of UNFPA. So there has been capacities. There's also been a search for IM, um, but Basically, we're going from a, a, trying to transition from a longer term coordination with the government into clusters. And a lot of the, the, the transitioning that's happening is with, is with the same actors. Uh, and you can feel that in the room that it's, you know, the government wants to be in the co-lead. There is the same local actors, the same national organizations. And it's, 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 it's been tricky to kind of um move into a more emergency role also as because of the context that i described earlier that the situation is so fragile that crisis has become the normal way of being um, everyone we talked to expressed the need for increased action to address gbv both prevention and response it was raised by the hc in the first meeting on the on the first day that the scale up that the situation is a lot about the, the gang violence, the killings, but also all the rape that has been taking place and is still taking place. Um, and she also raised the, the, the lack of services that I'll come back to. Um, across all the sectors, we just, there was a lack of consistency because of the significant turnover of staff. I mentioned that for the GBV side, we've had a double hatting Christian Vovi for the past months. Um, this was, it seemed to be the case in almost every sector. When we went to the intercluster to discuss kind of uh, their priorities and progress and service mapping, there were only two people in the room who'd also been in the um, talking to the global clusters in, in, I think, March, April. Most people had only been there for four, five weeks, which really shows the difficulty, right, in, in actually creating a momentum. Um, so we now have the, the coordination team recruited. It's, it's a dedicated team. They will start in August. We decided with Jennifer that it were good to give an update on the mission today, but I think once the coordinator comes in and has had the time to breathe and sort of settle, it would be important to have her also speak with the new IEM and give a more uh, detailed, um, updated uh, presentation. The other thing we found, which seemed to be similar for, for, for GBV, is that the humanitarian response, all the attention was on Port-au-Prince, uh, with the other parts of the country receiving little attention, 
uh, despite in a way security being the, hampered in the capital and the rest of the country having less security issues, but still having a lot of humanitarian needs. Shiva. So in terms of priorities, I think the first priority is really scaling up GBV services with national, local, uh, women-led organizations and international actors. Uh, we visited a very strong uh, women-led organization or association that was providing case management and referrals and, and um, working directly with survivors and, and a broader groups of women while we were there and they were very impressive. What I, what I did, we also had a, a four hour meeting with the GBV subcluster uh, and some of these priorities also came up there. I'm mentioning that the local women-led organization because most of the services are provided by local responders. There is of course the national health structure and they've been providing data as well on, on health services for, for rape. Um, and they are really struggling as well. And then there's the international actors. There's a, there are a few INGOs that are operating in Haiti. There was MS um, Médecins Sans Frontières. There was Save the Children. Uh, I think maybe IRC, but a very small office compared to other places. So that was one of the questions I had at the end is if there's a way, despite the, the security situation, which is really, really difficult, whether there's, a, whether there's a possibility to get more INGOs in as well, because what we're trying to do in a way is to, to really focus on longer term, ensuring that the national health structures don't collapse in collaboration with development actors and, and at the same time, moving to the focus on more immediate service delivery and making sure that the, there's an immediate response um, to survivors. Then uh, another thing that came out in the four hour meeting with the GBV subcluster um, was the coherence that the members of the subcluster were agreed that there was a need to, to, to develop GBV SOPs and to also adopt or have training on minimum standards. Uh, this also goes back to most of the actors have been already working for quite a long time under development paradigm. And now uh, there's a shift. And also there's a lot of lot of local actors so that we can come together and agree on the standards on what we mean with case management. What do we mean? There seemed to be some confusion by some of the local actors around what, what is risk mitigation, what is community outreach, what's prevention, et cetera. Uh, but I have to say, I was impressed by, by the number of local actors, and it was a very positive meeting in that it felt like there was a lot of will and, and interest and um, energy from the local civil society. There is still a need to focus on mapping referral pathways and case management. There are some actors, but it's a drop in the ocean. Um, in terms of the long term, the short term, you'll see there's like there's been an effort to map GBV service providers across the whole country between UNFPA, UN Women and Spotlight. So that there's that long-term effort, but then there's also now trying to really keep up to date what are the services that are being provided and are uh, that people have access to today in the current crisis. And then there's clearly not just for GBV, but uh, broadly, there's a need for more data collection, analysis, and sharing. There was a lot of attention on the potential for GVVMS uh, because the government is active in, in, in case management on the health side. They're providing some data. There's a lot of questions around sharing of data. Um, so we had a discussion as well with OHCHR around data sharing protocols and how to make that um, work better. Uh, and then linking that to referral as well, uh, Shiva. And then that's the last slide because I wanted to have time to discuss or answer questions. So the other priorities is really around the prioritization in a context where so much is about lack of protection and, and sexual violence, rape, as well as all the other forms of GBV. Um, there's, there's a need for more integrated programming 
I think it's it's happening in that everyone has everyone is trying to to invest to have more human resource capacities, but there are already discussions and outreach happening between health and UNFPA, I know. I'm saying UNFPA because our coordinator dedicated is not there, so it's more difficult to know what's what in terms of what UNFPA is doing. Then there is also uh, ongoing collaboration and on, on with, between food security and UNFPA which is actually, I discovered a huge job as well when you have very little staff in that it's it's trying to, to really get the outreach and defining the whole caseload and whether people have you know, the means to receive money uh, on their phones, do they have ID cards, et cetera. So um, I'm confident, I'm hope it's potentially they could reach uh, 9,000 households in, in August, but I also recognize that there's a lot of heavy lifting uh, also from UNFBA in terms of through the local actors getting all the data on all the people. What's important, uh, I think it's, for me, it's the first time I've seen discussions about such a big caseload being included into WFP programming. So if we could make it work, it's great. And then UNFBA has received SURF funding to continue um, cash and voucher assistance after that. Um, but, but it's clear in, in the discussions I had with WFP when I was there that they, every, everyone agrees that there will be an inclusion of survivors and women and girls at risk within a broader uh, category or women at risk and that UNFPA would in a way vouch for the uh, information on vulnerability being correct so that they won't have to give much information about vulnerability. Um, then risk mitigation. The week before I came, there was a training uh, on risk mitigation with protection, CCPM and shelter. And I heard other sectors are interested and willing. So there's there's a lot of uh, fertile ground in a way to work on GBV. Um, the last two points I want to, to raise is that the need to address the immediate needs while maintaining a longer term vision. And that seemed very clear also in terms of the funding and the actors that are there that there was a sense that no one thinks there's gonna be a lot a lot of funding. They haven't really felt, I think the humanitarian community in Haiti hasn't really felt a big difference since the scale up in terms of uh, funding and, um, and capacities before now. Uh, but that, and that also speaks to the need of working together um, and, and looking at what's, how can we make sure that the state doesn't collapse and become a fragile inefficient while we still manage to, 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 to manage the immediate crisis. And then in terms of funding, as I said, there's a need for more funding, there's a need for more diversification. There was uh, quite a long, dis um, a lot of discussion about establishing pooled funds. Um, so that will also come out of the mission. And I think that's potentially also something that's being discussed within OCHA without us being privy to all the conversations. But that came out quite often as one of the solutions maybe for local actors and national actors being able to access more funds because they are the ones who have access to the populations and are able to work within the communities, especially in a situation like Haiti. Those are all my slides. I hope it was coherent. Uh, I didn't have talking points. I went on it as it came. So, oh yeah, I see uh, Lara from, who is based in Haiti working on PSCA. Yeah, so just very quickly from the chat, Laura said that um, the three month extension has been approved. So the scale up is now oh. extended for three more months. So right. that was good to hear from Laura and Haiti. Um, and then um, there was a question from, um, uh, wait, I wrote the name down, Sandrine, um, saying that they heard you say that the government refused to recognize camps, or did you mean that they refused to have camps? But just to clarify that point, and if they refuse to recognize or have them, if you could say something about why. Um, and then just a quick question, unless it's called something else in Haiti, do you mean the CCCM cluster? Yes. Okay, 
<laughs> just want to make sure they don't have some. Did I say CCPM? Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> Sorry, that's the performance monitoring. Yeah, since, since, since IOM is not here, I, I will, uh, and UNHCR, I guess UNHCR could have corrected, but yeah, just to make sure it's not some other cluster no, no, we don't know about. CCCM, you're because right. Because I think CCCM is actually very recently activated there as part of the scale up. I don't think they had that cluster before. Um, and I think, as you mentioned, there's been resistance by the government. That's why they have sectors rather than clusters, because of all the negative things that happened with the UN in the past, especially around cholera. But if you want to answer the question from um, about the camps, and then quickly, we're going to turn over to Eric, who was also there recently for six weeks, to just add very quickly a couple of points. So to you, Astrid, and then to Eric. Yeah. So. The, the government doesn't want to recognize formal camps with tents and the UN and refugees, basically, or IDPs. They, they accept that they exist, but it's informal settlements. It's people moving from one poor area of the city to another and then uh, managing maybe with a, where we were, it was with a committee, uh, of one of the gangs. Um, with an NGO affiliated with the gangs, where one of the, 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 the gang structure came in accompanying the NGO. So I don't know the exact, I should be careful, I don't know the exact politics, but clearly the, the camps are in areas that are controlled by the gangs, the one where we went at least, where the police has no access and the state has no access. So I th it's political, they don't want to get into a situation where you have longer term camps as they uh, think of that as the you know um, being associated with the earthquake in 2010 which brought cholera and a lot of uh, where there was a sense that the international community took over and that's also very clear in the response like for the GBV AOR there the um, there there is a focal point from the directorate and she's very very engaged but it's very clear that the government does not want to, um, I mean, they do want to be very much part of the decisions and, and they're very present in the room when uh, for the coordination. Yeah. Um, Which is positive for sustainability, right? Yeah. So um, er over, sorry, quickly to Eric and then Laura has raised her hand to ask if she can make one more comment. We're, we're actually out of the time that we had for questions and answers. So please be quick, Eric, and then quick, Laura, over to you, Eric. And Eric, can you introduce yourself? I know you're from UNICEF, but just because there's several Erics in child <laughs> protection, we'll just let you introduce yourself. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, and greetings, colleagues. Uh, my name is Eric Dental. I work for UNICEF as a GBVIE specialist, but I also sit on the uh, UNICEF Global Emergency Response Team, and I do deploy to different uh, emergency countries to support country offices on GBV programming. So as part of that role, I was deployed to Haiti from 26th of May to 10th of July. And it was an opportunity to meet with uh, Astrid there when uh, she was there for the mission she was talking about. And basically from my side, I think I was there to basically look at uh, the specialized programming within UNICEF as part of the scale up plan. Uh, but also to look at uh, risk mitigation across the UNICEF uh, programming section. Uh, as you may know, in addition to the clusters, UNICEF is also uh, working on GBV risk mitigation within our own programming, but also to support some of the coordination efforts that uh, S3 mentioned. Uh, what I think I saw in terms of the situation, I think S3 cover a lot. I don't want to talk about that, but I think around the, um, in terms of increasing violence. I think this is something that the partners continue to receive. Uh, if you talk to most of the partners, uh, most of them are receiving, the case law is getting heavy and they do not have that kind of capacity to provide support where uh, a particular partner is receiving about 50 cases a month and they have very few social workers working on these issues. And case management, like uh, Astrid mentioned, is a big challenge. Uh, having limited capacity, but also not being trained on case management. And I think one of the things that she mentioned is in terms of the capacity that the partners continue to lose. Uh, we have what we call the burdens program. It's a humanitarian program to Haitian, but also to other countries. So you have about four countries, Haiti, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, and I think Nicaragua, where they are taking about 30,000 people every month. 
So what is happening is that uh, Haiti continue to lose manpower, even including uh, case workers, social workers that are trained to provide GBV case management are leaving. So partners continue to recruit uh, staff and the staff continue to leave. Uh, also, one of the things we saw is that um, if you look at what Astrid mentioned, most of the services are provided through local partners, but you will realize that they are using safe shelters as one of the main service entry points. So what happens is that if you cannot access the uh, safe shelter, then you cannot access GBV services because they do not have safe centers. I mean, women and girls safe spaces. So they basically have safe shelters. So I think that is a challenge. And I think the opportunity, of course, the local partners, but also from the government side, we have the social welfare that is there, and then we have social worker, but also the police. They have the police uh, unit that is responsible for children. They call them BPM that is also there. Uh, in terms of the challenges, I think as we mentioned, but one of the things I think I saw there was the increase in attention and media focus on GBV. So what that is doing is that there is so much request for GBV data, but also uh, people come in to talk to survivors. They want to interview survivors so that they can establish the extent of the problem in Haiti. While I was there, in fact, a uh, UNICEF executive director was report, uh, visiting other uh, high-level UN personnel were visiting and they wanted to talk to survivors. So we have to provide some of the guardians that were uh, provided the interaction uh, guardians around uh, interviewing survivors, but also some other guardians. I think this is something that is really, really a big issue. Data management, as we mentioned that, the way data is managed in Haiti is a big challenge. Like people writing to UNICEF talking about rape cases, how UNICEF can intervene instead of reporting these cases directly to a uh, service provider. And then also around the risk mitigation piece side, I think the training for the frontline workers on the GBV pocket guy is a very big uh, need because what is happening is that there is very limited awareness among people where to assess the available GBV services. In as much as we do not have services in Haiti, the available services, you have very limited awareness. From the UNICEF view report, we realized that of the people uh, interviewed, only 16 people, uh, percent of the population that we interviewed knew where uh, existing services were. So I, in terms of raising awareness on the available services, I think that is it. Uh, I will share this um, because of the time, but I think in terms of uh, the collaboration with UNFP and other partners, I think this is something with UNICEF, we kind of covering part of the HROP, which is about 322,417. UNICEF is kind of covering 30% of that, just working with two, uh, three partners. Of course, funding is a big challenge, but with the risk mitigation, I think there where we also need a bit of support. Already, the GBV pocket guys have been translated into CRIO. I think that will be an opportunity for uh, the capacity building we'll be doing with the different sectors and also what, as we mentioned, with the other uh, clusters. Uh, the GBV referral cards have been adapted because with the GBV pocket guard, the frontline worker will now have the opportunity to refer survivor from one service provider to another. So we want to use the existing partners as entry points so that um, frontline worker can make referral to the partners who will then follow with the uh, case management processes. Uh, for the schools, they already with the Ministry of Education, we have code of conduct developed and then uh, a big section on sexual violence and uh, in schools, how to address that is also included. Uh, there are a couple of initiatives. I will stop here because of time. I will probably put them in, in the chat, but it was a big opportunity. And thank you, Astrid, for the opportunity we had together. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And um, if you have a report that you've written that's um, that we can share, we can share it with the minutes and you know provide a link in, into uh, any minutes to send out. But I was gonna say, I think as Astrid said, once we get the coordinator and the IM on the ground, I think we can do a dedicated call to on Haiti. You know, here it was just because Astrid came back like two weeks ago, so we wanted to get this out fresh. But you know, we 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 do consider this a topic that deserves a whole dedicated mm -hmm. call. But we we want to do that when we get the other um, when the coordinators on the ground. Laura, one minute. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'll try to be brief. And thank you, Eric. Actually, he said most of my points, so uh, I will also gain time. 
So basically, I joined the RCO last week, uh, the RC mm -hmm. office in Haiti as PSA coordinator. But I had okay. been working here for four years with UNICEF as PSA specialist. And I can't believe I missed uh, Astrid and Eric's mission. But anyway, yeah. um, uh, so quick points. Um, I For the PSA uh, strategy and national action plan, we definitely need the GBV and child protection referral pathways for um, handling uh, PSA allegations and, of course, um, referring survivors. And all the challenges that were mentioned by uh, Astrid and uh, Eric are on the ground and there are even more. Like in some places we before, when I was working with UNICEF, we knew, let's say, there is a clinic providing services, but then it's in this gang's uh, area, which is uh, not accessible for people in the parallel street, but which is controlled by another gang, which makes um, access to services even harder. So it's not even by area anymore in the, some areas of the capital. It's literally which street and which area and which gang is controlling this place. Anyway, I will not uh, take longer, but I'm looking forward to the collaboration and uh, I can be put in touch with the new coordinator, with the new um, uh, team that is coming in August. And I'm already in close contact with uh, Christian Bouvi, who is also uh, supporting on PSCA, not only on uh, GBV. That's what I wanted to say. Um, thank you. And I'm looking forward to receiving the reports and uh, collaborating with the new team on the ground. Thank you so much. So we're out of time. If for any reason we have time at the end, we can come back to questions. But what I would suggest is that you put your questions in the chat. And then Astrid, Laura, and Eric, you're all welcome to um, answer the questions that are in the chat as we move on to our next topic. Can I just um, say one yeah. thing, Jennifer? Yes, go and ahead, I Astrid. promise I'll let go. I'm just thinking because of that discussion and now that the three months scale up has been, uh, three months extension has been approved. I think it's super important for everyone to to realize that that's just the scale up and whatever staff and capacities need to be much longer term for anything positive to come out in Haiti. Just that we don't think of, oh, there's another three months, so now we can send another search. There's been a lot of search from all of us and now we need the longer term. Sorry, over to you, Jennifer. No, and I, I do think, you know, there, there are questions raised about Haiti as a humanitarian setting in the sense that, you know, it's being looked at as practically a, a failed state and that the violence is gang violence. And I think in the past that hasn't been a criteria as a humanitarian setting, and that's been the big issue with Central America. So we know that El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras have all had huge amounts of gang violence. Um, it's only very recently, and it's usually because of um, natural disasters or El Nino or La Nina or something that they have been seen as humanitarian emergencies. So, you know, I do think this is worth having further discussion. We're not the decision makers on this, but I think it's good for us to also sort of grapple with, with um, this issue. And I know that ERC did call it a scale up. So um, it's it looks like OCHA is moving that direction. I know other organizations moved that direction a number of years ago. Um, so now we are going to move on to Cristina Palacios. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Inigo Ballester. Oh, yeah, 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 very nice. Thank you. Please say your name so that I, uh, I probably it's just... like that. Well, it's actually Inigo, but I okay, it's great. no problem. So both of them are going to do a presentation on what they have done for the response in Turkey. And over to both of you who, um, and Christina Palacio, you might recognize her. She was many years as a GBV coordinator, a program specialist and supported coordination in Venezuela. And she, as soon as she left Venezuela and was supposed to take a break, she rushed to the response for Turkey. So I hope she'll get her, her, her time off coming up, but over to you both. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, hi, everyone. It's good to see many familiar names also from Venezuela. So as uh, Jennifer mentioned, I'm the current GBV subsector coordinator for the earthquake response in Turkey, not the cross-border Syria, because the GBV subsector 
sector uh, was activated in Turkey right after the earthquake for the response uh, in Turkey. You may have heard about the GBB working group for the refugee response in Turkey, but after the earthquake, uh, UNFPA started leading the, the GBB sub sector, so we were the providers of last resort there. So our missions, both for Inigo and I, are ending very soon because the humanitarian response is also ending very soon because we are transitioning into the early, early recovery phase. And also the GBB subsector is transitioning into a new structure that we are still uh, discussing. Uh, so most probably our UNFPA local colleagues are going to take over the coordination role and it may be a co-coordination group together with uh, UNHCR or, well, this is still under discussions. They may uh, return to the previous 3RP response and with it, the previous coordination structure, but this is something that still needs to be decided. But for the time being, the humanitarian response, response will continue until, until mid-August. Um, uh, with it, the GBB subsector uh, coordination mechanism. So with the support of Inigo, or Spanish, <laughs> that's why the N is a bit difficult to pronounce, uh, we've managed to develop uh, many interesting tools. I think it was very important also to highlight Inigo's support and having a dedicated IM uh, to achieve all these accomplishments. So um, uh, I will give the floor directly to Inigo, uh, who has been of great support for the GBB subsector in Turkey. So we hope that even though we are not going to continue working there, these tools can be uh, further developed and used for any coordination, coordination structure they may establish after the earthquake response. So thank you so much, Inigo. I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Gracias, Cristina. Uh, I'm gonna be a bit quickly because I don't want to take much time. So let me share first. I will be I, I will be share a couple of things, but first I will share a quickly uh, little presentation. So basically, as Cristina said, well, actually, let me move because I'm with the Zoom, with the, it's opening thousand of windows in my screen. Yeah, I will. Uh, we have been working and in, in, in trying to make a bit of sense of all the information that we're collecting okay so in the end we are we sort of built a, a response dashboard that i will show you is the, the way that is collecting in a cumulative way uh, a little bit of how the response has been going in relation to gbb i will explain how this gbb data has been collected then i can just uh, mention quickly some data collection tool has developed those tools have been developed over over the Cobo system, and then we will be sharing what is the tool itself, the templates to with the GBB UR. So basically, any 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 other can take those templates, those tools, even if they are uh, in the context of Turkey, but they are very 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 easy to 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 update and contextualize to your context. Okay, especially the safety audit tool and and the and the, our service mapping uh, collection tool. Okay, so this tool will be will be shared as a repository so people can use them and adapt them in their specific uh, context. And finally, very quickly, I show you, this has nothing to do with the Turkey uh, response, but it's like uh, some experiments I'm doing on, on my side on potential use of artificial intelligence uh, tools as information assistance. So I will show you a very quick, quick, quick uh, showcase of some experiment we are doing with, with using, uh, we call it GBB, a assistant for coordination okay basically an information retrieval tool but very very advanced okay so in relation and going back to the response uh, the response monitoring was actually a subset of the existing 3rp the 3rp is the response um, uh, ongoing for the syrian crisis so it was decided to 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 continue with this with this framework, but sort of adapted, so the partners were already used to it. Okay, so in particular for GBB, these are the the the, the indicators that they, we have been using to collect information. We also collected some information from 
from a specific PSCA indicator, which comes for accounting uh, to populations uh, database. And then we decided to include some data from, from, from other general protection indicators, but that we consider of interest, okay? So I'm gonna just quickly, basically, I think it's better I said directly the dashboard instead of that. So, okay, there it is, there we go. Okay, you can access this dashboard, hold on. From, we develop as well the Turkey Relief Web uh, space where you can access to this cumulative dashboard. Also, uh, I mean, the, the usual products that we are producing, like uh, minutes, uh, 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 documents, and guidelines developed by the by the subsector partners and members. So we keep this lively so people can have access to it to these guidelines in a in a very centralized aspect. Okay. The dashboard itself, as I told you, is cumulative, okay? So basically it has, it's simple, it's not really too many. I, we didn't want to input that many tables and data. Obviously, if some people or if some partners, they need very specific data on a particular, I would say, district or province, obviously they can always come to us and we can just prepare ad hoc products, okay? So this is more like an over, overview of how the response has going, okay? So you got an interactive map that shows um, the affected area taking into account this is a massive area it's like probably there are like 500 kilometers from from across all these 11 provinces there are like more than 3,000 settlements okay like basically whole cities were destroyed and people were basically want to move to 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 massive camps that there are like some we visit several of them like probably like uh, Christina can tell uh, that but 4,000 people living in settlements I mean it was like a quite Shocking, okay. The most affected area you can see here is is, is a type. Okay, the darker the area is the higher number of settlements. Also, the higher the circle is the higher number of people rich. Okay, so most of the response was focused on yeah, the bit bigger. So most of the response has been focused in the Hatai area. And there I'm gonna just go to this. So probably you will see, okay. This one is actually better. This one it will show you basically the evolution of the in the different provinces. Okay, so you can see as for example as I said, Hatay is the one that is receiving the higher number of uh, rich people and attention. But the other provinces still even if it was slow at the beginning, they are sort of catching up in terms of of response. Okay, you can also we have here as well the the evolution across the months cumulative. Then we wanted to provide as well highlighting the most uh, higher these districts in relation to number of settlement and people reach. Okay, and uh, we have just added recently a second page where you can just have a look on on main figures on the main indicators. Okay, so basically there are like four specific GBB indicators from this from this uh, response framework. There is one related PSCA indicator. In that case, it was also coming from the PRP. And then you can see also here a little bit of the evolution. Okay, we also wanted to to present uh, the partners' presence in a in a very easy to see manner. Okay, so you can see for every of the eleven affected provinces, more or less the presence of the partners who are reporting. All this data comes from from activity info response, which was already in place and is being hosted by our colleagues from protection in Indonesia, but actually they are collecting also information from the other sector. So basically the one of the very good aspects is that thanks to to the to the force through all these years in CRP, there were uh, already several systems in place that we we leverage and take uh, advantage of it. Okay. So especially in relation to to response collection of data. Okay. So basically you I will we will say in those links so you can just access to to this in the in the in the under the relief web page okay so let me go quickly again to the powerpoint okay sorry well basically a summary here then we developed several uh, collection tools uh, uh, especially a safety audit tool which is intended to be used in in settlements to also to to measure the the risks of 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 the of the, I mean, the, the settlement itself, especially focused on GBB, PCA, but also we we integrated a lot of inputs from child protection and also the disability task force. And we also have a tool for legal service provision monitoring, 
this actually the tool which is more focused to Turkey, okay? So it's it's geared towards providing and uh, measuring the the how the the, the services in legal uh, uh, barristers, also hotlines, etc. In Turkey has been being used. But then we have the focal point in the education Kobo tool, which is basically a service mapping. This first tool and third tool, actually, we, we think that we can share with the GBBAUR because they are very, very, very easy to, 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 to modify and to update. And, and even like a, any, any IEM or any monitoring people could be implemented under, under Kobo. So basically, uh, this uh, will be sharing with the GBBAUR. Okay. So, so I'm a bit quick here because I don't want to take much of your time. And um, basically, I don't know if you have any question up to here because I'm going to change uh, subject a bit radically now. So so sorry for being a bit rushed. Okay, any any questions or we can just address them? I, I think uh, you should keep going because of time. Okay, okay um, yes. There, there is a question, but maybe if we run okay. out of time, you can answer it in the chat. Thanks. Okay, and then I'm going to uh, start off the show. Okay, okay. As I explained to you, we are, I mean, I've been just working on, on how to use these new artificial intelligence tools, etc. Okay, so basically, I've been working on a tool that is an agent that you can keep a conversation with it, but the agent, the information is learning from a knowledge corpus. Okay, in the knowledge corpus, it has been fit with a dozen, like 13, 14 uh, specific key documents on GBB coordination and GBD programming. Okay, so basically, it's like having someone who has read all these documents, and then you can just start making a conversation, asking questions about it, and it will retrieve not only the most probable answers to your question, but also the source document has been used. Also, it, ha it has the ability of choosing tools, so it can just go to uh, Wikipedia to leverage the information, okay? So basically, what I'm going to do is uh, very quickly so you exactly an example, so I must have it open here of the tool. This tool is not fit for use, so basically it won't be served, basically experiment and showcase of how these things I can be. So basically it has been implemented like a like an app, so basically I can just say like, like things like, I don't know, like for example, hi, I am Inigo, and I would say, and I am, I don't know, an emergency coordinator, okay? So it's similar to the ChatGPT, but focus on, on on, on, on information from humanitarian uh, GBB documents, okay? So basically it's asking things here, so we can just ask things like, for example, uh, what are GBB guiding principles? And then the, the agent will uh, search for the information from the different documents and will try to come up with, a, with an answer which is basically a combination of all the information needed. So basically it's providing an answer. I've been sort of testing with colleagues, so basically it's quite accurate. And also the good thing is providing the sources. For example, in that case, it took the sources for the interagency minimum standard for GBB and also the harm for coordinating. There are like other things, like for example, like easy question, imagine that you don't know, like for example, it's say, okay, which UN agency leads the, the GBB response in emergencies. So, so it would say, okay, in that case, it's, uh, obviously we all know UNFPA, but sometimes you can be like, okay, but what is uh, UNFPA? So in that case, because if those documents are very, very specific, maybe they don't say what is UNFPA because they assume that you know, in that case, the, the, the agent will need to look for another source. And probably it will go to look into the Wikipedia as it is, okay? It's selecting this information now for the Wikipedia, the finding, okay? even has memory, I can say like, uh, well, what is my name? And um, probably you will remember Inigo and what do I do? And uh, I guess say, because I say it, I don't know, probably sometimes fail, but I don't know. Yeah, as an emerging coordinator, because I mentioned at the beginning. So basically it's an example of how these very, very, very new technologies can be applied from, from some practical questions. In that case, it's a very broad. It has been using uh, documentation that could be like an assistant in case that you want to find specific uh, information. You can do it in a way of maintaining a natural conversation in natural language, etc. So basically, uh, I'm over. So thank you um, very much. So, so, so Anas, Anastasia asked you 
about the referral card, what, uh, what information does it contain? Can you give, can you write that question in your, yeah, yeah let me check because in your I'm, AI and see what it tells us. Ah, sorry. Yeah. 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 Hold on. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I was just jumping ahead to say, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, no, no, sorry, your sorry. AI, the yeah, yeah, question let me check. from Anastasia. So what, do you, what, what is the question? Her sorry. question is, um, the referral, what, what information does the referral card contain? What you you'd have to say which the referral card that you mentioned earlier or that was mentioned by Christina. What, what does a referral? Anastasia, do you want to speak up and say which specifically, since it's your question? I think it is already responded, uh, Jennifer. I mentioned the referral card. Um, ah, it's for okay. Haiti. Okay, yeah, for Haiti. So I already Haiti. responded okay. in the chat. Okay, ah, okay, maybe okay. you can respond to Fulvia's question. Okay, I can I can ask actually <laughs> what information <laughs> does a referral card contain. So probably if it's already in one specifying one of the documents, okay, saying uh, information about GV services provided under contact information, be used to refer GV survivors to this service provider. The information on the card is confidential and should be handled with care to ensure an authorized disclosure, et cetera, et cetera. And sources is the gender based uh, manual, as you can already think from the FDA and the GBB standard operating pro uh, procedures. Okay, so basically, what well, <laughs> I ask here in case that that I wouldn't know what exactly it is like a referral. So but I think it was okay, well, that works. probably, okay. <laughs> so it was so, for Haiti, it was for <laughs> Haiti. So we asked to the agent anyway, <laughs> sorry. So um, Fulvia asked you if this would be limited to a number of questions that we can manage or the idea is for any question. Uh, I think you said it goes to Wikipedia afterwards, right? If no, like... no, the thing is that uh, it has an experiment because actually also because of my background, I'm just working on my PhD thesis on this kind of things, okay? But basically, uh, uh, in this experiment has been trained, I'm telling you around, oh, let me see, because I can share the screen in the presentation. Uh, I train it in, okay, you can see a plethora of documents here, like training in in, in the minimum standard for GBV. So basically like a, I use like around 11 documents. Some of the documents were quite long, around 400 pages, I would say. And then a couple of websites, okay, on general information. Basically has been bold trained, but obviously you can refine. Oh, you, you can, can put, a, put all the documents from our help desk in there. Uh, yeah, but obviously that needs a bit of working because some <laughs> documents are, no, no, but if it's some of the things I'm working on, some documents could be more okay. related to programming or they're more specific to 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 to, to response, et cetera. So then you can sort of tune and create so it makes more more accurate mm -hmm. in the way it it helps to, to basically find. The good thing also is, is uh, using the information those documents and only only goes to the Wikipedia in case that the the in, the response that it gets is not probabilistically close to the boundaries it is it's being wow. set up. Okay, so so it goes for example before I ask what UDFPA is and in those those documents the funny thing is that they all because they are very specialized documents for for us humanitarian. So we all know what is UNFPA, obviously. So basically, it's not anything about UNFPA history or you when it was founded here, obviously, because we all right. assume. So in that case, the agent says, okay, I cannot find it here. So then I'm authorized or allowed to go to the Wikipedia. Okay. And they went to the Wikipedia and retrieved a summary of, of what is UNFPA when it was founded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. So much. Yeah. Sorry, la, maybe last question. Uh, I think it will be interesting to discuss and to see if it will be possible to use this uh, app that you are developing uh, to uh, also develop a secondary a secondary data review documents. Yeah. No, the, the thing, okay. Yeah, uh, that would be amazing. Things, yeah, I'm talking, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no, one of the things is that at the moment, these experiments, because I'm using some third party uh, services for make it round. Basically, I'm paying them from my pocket. Okay, <laughs> so that is why this tool is not going to be shared because basically you will be ru uh, ruining me. Okay, so but at the same time, I'm in touch with people from UNFPA Innovation UNFPA IT because, for example, mm. in UNFPA they got uh, access to to I would say corporate services, and in fact, they recently they did some agreements. I think with with Google. Uh, Google corporate services. Ah, so so okay. some of these tools could be eventually be <coughs> implemented under, under an organization, being curated by the organization and being 
basically endorsed and supported by the by a given organization. So, yeah, at the moment, this is basically a, a showcase, an experiment. It's not not even fit for for sharing. <laughs> well, I, I, I recommend yeah. that you look into Erla E R L H A, um, who actually they just closed their um, funding for the innovation, but they might have some other calls coming up. But they have funding for GBV and innovation that you can apply for. It's up to one hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. So, so you okay, might want to check you. into that. And um, sure. mm -hmm. Tony, who I know was also there. And if we had more time, I'd give you a, a few moments, Tony. Let's see if we have any time at the end. But she did write about the safety audit tool. And actually, CCCM at the global level um, has been asking us about good safety audit tools because they've been doing safety audits since okay. 2017. Uh -huh. every year in um, Somalia, so yeah. um, from the this tool, nutrition people. Yeah, yeah, actually the tool will be, actually I shared already with, with our colleague, with Shiva from GBAUR, but mm -hmm. this tool, the safety audit in particular, that Tony, Tony from OCHA is aware as well, I mean, we put a lot of effort because we started with an initial template that it was shared with us by the GBAUR, and I think we uh, leveraged it. We actually try to input uh, all contributions, not only from GBV uh, partners, but also child protection. They they were heavily involved. Also disability task force was heavily involved and, and PSEA. So basically the safety audit that we are having now, uh, we can, you, you can actually, I would say that you can even deploy it as it is in any right. operation because it's, it's very general in the sense that it's focused for temporary settlements but it has very little things on on specific to Turkey. Yeah, obviously, you can change some questions. For example, in which language do you want the the I don't know the hotlines or whatever. Instead of Turkey, you can use uh, whatever context you are in the operation. But the tool, in particular, safety AD tool, I think basically uh, you can just uh, implement very very straight away. I I will share with with see by the, the right. you are not only the not only the, the the questionnaire but also the Kobo the Kobo coding that yeah that sounds idea. great. Yeah, we have, can we have our, our regional input. IMs have the Kobo, so we can yeah, share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, out. they can take the Kobo coding yeah. and adapt it and just put it Perfect. and deploy it straight away. Yeah. Right. Okay. The other thing I just wanted to mention is that Eric um, had mentioned the challenges in Haiti of the high level missions where people insist, and believe me, they insist on talking to survivors, no matter what we say, we know that they push and push and push. This happened quite a bit in Cox's Bazaar, where you have the different SRSGs, and then you have like UN Action, and then you have NORCAP, and then you have, you know, EDs from different UN agencies all showing up at a new emergency, and it's actually happening right now in DRC. And so I'm sorry to hear it's also happening in Haiti. Um, and I think actually the global CCCM person was saying how these high level missions are also going to the same camps or whatever they're being called. Um, so the IO group was this inter-organizational um, working group of call to action, um, developed a, um, a document specifically on how to deal with these high level missions and Emily Krasner has now put the link into the chat. So if you scan back, scroll back through the chat, you can find that. Um, so that's relevant to any country that is suddenly being spotlighted and you have a bunch of high level missions coming and asking to speak to survivors. So please do um, take a look at that tool and, and use it if necessary. Um, and I don't wanna take any more time away from you, Fulvia. So let's move to Fulvia and if there's time to go back to any of our presentations for questions at the end, then we can make that our AOB. Over to you, Fulvia. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and yes, so I'm Fulvia. I'm the Holopsidia GBV coordinator, but actually today speaking more from my UNFPA hat as the regional GBV specialist. Um, let me share my screen. If I find the right, uh, I can also share yeah, it's here. easier for you. Uh, I think it's okay. Do I'll you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Put it. Okay. So, um, yeah. So as as Jennifer was uh, was saying. Um, 
some years back, actually in 2017, as the as the coordination group, also as the whole of Syria GBD uh, coordination, we had developed uh, a, a two years strategy on adolescent girls, and this came basically from uh, the realization that uh, that adolescent girls uh, were particularly affected by the Syrian crisis, uh, um, and and that there was not enough focus in terms of dedicated programming, in terms of empowerment. Uh, uh, in terms of access to um, to addressing those friendly spaces uh, and uh, services, and so after the the two years strategy that was specific to uh, to the whole of Syria, uh, we had kind of a, a, a review and evaluation of how how it went, and we realized that the fact of having the whole of Syria addressing the strategy had actually had some spillovers uh, in the other countries in the region and Syria response. So for example, uh, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Iraq, uh, et cetera, where also uh, through the office where I sit, uh, the, the regional humanitarian hub, uh, we had supported the, some, um, some, some initiatives uh, that were looking at addressing girls specifically, so beyond the, the whole of Syria context. And one of the key outcomes of that, the review of the whole of Syria strategy was actually that uh, uh, UNF, UNFPA at regional level should look into having an overarching strategy or framework uh, for addressing girls in particular. So last year, that's uh, that's what we tried to do from the UNFPA more programmatic perspective. Uh, at regional level, we came together among all the different uh, uh, departments. So this is not only a GBD strategy or GBD framework, but it's really um, a, a framework that uh, that looks into the different uh, uh, spheres of what UNFPA does. And in that sense. Uh, um, we, we actually wanted to, to come up with something that it is uh, uh, by adolescent girls for adolescent girls. So the point of uh, um, consultation with the adolescent girls throughout the region and understanding what were their needs and their hopes uh, was really strong. So this is, uh, this is all the background, how we came to the framework. And now I'll go a bit more into uh, what the framework uh, entails. Uh, so, in the development uh, of the of the framework, we had a consultant on board, who's Nina, who many of you also know from the capacity building strategy of the AOR. Um, so, we went through a deliberative review and then a consultation first internally with UNFPA and partner staff. Uh, with 50 semi-structure uh, interviews, actually in 11 Arab states. Um, the interesting thing was that initially we had an idea of doing this mostly for the humanitarian context, but then it ended up uh, uh, being um, a larger scope. So we had humanitarian and non-humanitarian context. Uh, actually, I should say humanitarian nexus and more development context. Uh, um, and then, as I was saying, the consultation with adolescent girls involved uh, approximately uh, 200 uh, girls um, from a large number of countries, again, so Egypt, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Palestine, Tunisia, and, and Jordan. And the, the, really, the, the point of the, of the framework was that everyone uh, all the country offices and all the different departments in the regional office were doing something in relation to adolescent girls, but there was not an overarching uh, framework that would guide us towards uh, some defined objectives. So the main objective of developing this framework was to have these uh, uh, overarching umbrella um, general objectives that uh, um, that that we aim to to achieve um, as a regional office as and in the country offices. So we came up with four objectives. Um, the first one is the creation of this enabling environment uh, for adolescent girls uh, 
uh, access to a large number of different uh, program services and, and information. Um, so in, in, in these objectives, some of the things we thought would help achieve this was in particular, I would like the establishment of field friendly spaces uh, um, and, uh, and, and the implementation of, of evidence-based uh, uh, interventions that, that of course uh, uh, impact on the meaningful access uh, uh, to services. The second one, um, targeted programs are delivered that specifically address adolescent girls' needs and promote the individual and collective empowerment. So uh, in this one, we, we developed uh, and thought of this, the implementation of this three pillar approach, uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the need to play and learn, the need to be heard and to lead and the need to be mobile and, and safe. So this in, in, in the development of the framework seem to be uh, kind of uh, uh, including all the different spheres uh, of the adolescent girl life uh, in terms of uh, programs that we could uh, that, that we could offer, and then of course also the we looked in terms of the structure at country office level and at regional office level. So the need to have um, adolescent girls focal points because again many times uh, the work with adolescent girls falls. Uh, um, in, in the under the responsibility of many different people in the office. So it's the gender team, the GBV team, the SRH team, um, et cetera, et cetera. So having one person that can bring together the, the ideas of the different departments uh, was, was important. Uh, the third objective is related to capacity, skills, uh, attitudes, uh, beliefs uh, of, of staff, UNFPA staff and partner staff. Um, to support uh, the, the different steps of the Blessing Girls program. Um, so from the design, the delivery, the monitoring, the evaluation, et cetera. And in this one, we thought um, uh, also, yes, yeah, so ongoing training and of course, uh, um, not only on, on the technical skills, but also as I was saying, related to, to values clarification, beliefs, uh, et cetera. And the fourth one uh, is building evidence and learning based on um, and sharing of good practices, uh, et cetera. And so definitely part of this is to continue amplifying the, 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 the voices of, of adolescent girls, uh, uh, but it's also um, continuing organizing uh, Adolescent Girls Summit. We had a regional Adolescent Girls Summit uh, last year in which the Adolescent Girls were able to identify advocacy asks uh, and present them to the League of Arab States. Uh, uh, so, and and in, under this objective, we also quote was um, to engage with, uh, with the other organizations and uh, like share experiences and learn from the good practices that uh, uh, that are happening beyond the NFPA. Uh, I'll stop here and see if, if there is any any question. I'll put the link also in uh, uh, in the chat. I would say for the for the full document. I'm looking, well, <laughs> Shiva has a thumb up. Let's see, uh, is, I'm looking to see if I'm missing any hands here. Any, you don't have to, you can ask a question, but you can also make a comment or if you wanna say, you know, if, if there's something that you have been doing that um, is similar or has a, have a good practice. Um, also, please feel free. Wait, I have two new messages. So you can also just take your mute off, I think, and ask your question. If you have one. So we're getting thank you for sharing the work. Any questions? So Fulvia, I have a question. I'm just thinking, 
um, you know, I think having uh, empowered girls, wait, I can turn my camera back on, um, in, in uh, other clusters could be very useful also. And, and I'm thinking when I was in Somalia, I was talking to the CCCM folks who were saying that um, there was a, a, a weakness or a gap in them receiving through their complaint mechanisms information from adolescents. And they were asking um, us if we, I mean, I think through like, for example, in Somalia, UNFPA has very strong work with youth, but I know in other countries, you know, there's this whole youth compact as, and then there's adolescent girls. And I'm just wondering, um, I think, you know, linking through what CCCM camp managers are hearing or not hearing, it could be also a, a great way to sort of link into this uh, kind of learning where you, you can, you know, through the, the empowerment of the adolescent girls feed into um, the camp management complaint mechanisms or things. So I don't know, I, I, I sort of thought of that in Somalia and was thinking, you know, maybe other clusters would also really appreciate getting feedback from adolescent girls and, and could this framework sort of enable that to happen? Yeah, thank you so much. I think that uh, um, it's definitely an, a super important point. And like in the in the whole of Syria experience, we've kind of done this with the, the voices from Syria. And I think now it's, it's mostly known to, to everyone because we do have these focus group discussions with the adolescent girls. And then, and we have questions related to how how it was uh, like the the risks associated with accessing other services, and we normally feed this back to the different uh, the the different sectors. So based on what comes out of the focus discussion, saying okay, these are the main risks uh, from the perspective of women, from the perspective of adolescent girls, and if there is any difference, we normally highlight this. But yes, I think that. It's a, it's a point to make in all different sectors that it's not just, uh, um, I mean, yes, the, the, what, what comes up normally is that they are a bit forgotten in the whole response, not just in the humanitarian response, not just mm. forgotten in the GDB world. Or, uh, so it, it's definitely some advocacy that we should, uh, uh, we should be more vocal on, I, I think. Yeah, and I think we talk a lot about the voices as, you know, something that that raises voices, but runs sort of as a complementary um, or in addition to document of the HPC. But but maybe looking at some of the enabling factors and methodologies from voices could be used as a way to increase the voice of adolescent girls in other sectors without it having to be about producing a whole report on voices, which is quite a lot of work and, and can become a bit overwhelming for, for some. But I see Fanta has his hand up. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Fanta. Fanta is from South Sudan. He's the coordinator there. Over to you, Fanta. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, great to see Fulvia and also all other colleagues familiar face and names. Just one uh, quick one uh, on the framework. Uh, are we using it as uh, an entry point for integrated SRH and GBV, or are we looking at it as a GBV programming entry point? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think that uh, part of it is definitely, I mean, with, in, the, in the region, we are also working very much on, on making the services more integrated. So a uh, part of, of, of this is, uh, is also to, to make sure they, they have access to, uh, to integrated uh, GBV and SLH services. Um, but yes, again, it's, uh, I think that then it's more for even each country office to, to define a bit better um, how their work fits into this larger framework, but having a kind of an umbrella document uh, that guides uh, the, the, the path in the next uh, couple of years. 
Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Jennifer, you're on mute. Thank you, Shiva. <laughs> so any other questions or comments for Fulvia? I see that um, Claire has, uh, we, there's several Claire's now. We, we, we go through this of having different Jessica's and, and uh, Pamela's and several other names. We now have a couple of Claire's, but Claire Lofthouse from uh, Plan has written a comment in the chat, but said she'll be following up bilaterally. Um, any other comments okay. or questions? Or Claire, did you want to say anything verbally, out loud? Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Fulvia. Thanks so much for the presentation. It's, um, yeah, it's really, really great timing. I have a couple of things pinging in my mind, but um, yeah, maybe Fulvia, I'll just send you an email and we can we can discuss those um, bilaterally. Um, really, really great to see so much prioritization being placed on adolescent girls. I think I, I was just nodding along with everything that you said. Um, so yeah, forward to discussing that maybe with you in more detail and, and others uh, in the near future. Thanks so much for the presentation. All right, thank you. Yes, sure. And we also just, uh, we were at, uh, at Women Deliver and we had a, a dedicated presentation on adolescent girls in the Arab states, including uh, with Plan International actually speaking about the, the advocacy asks uh, from the girls summit so definitely happy to to get in touch i'm going on leave for two weeks though so maybe after that <laughs> <laughs> if sounds possible good. sounds good um yeah and maybe we could have um i know that she was already working on the agenda for the august call and she's actually going to be out for a month so we're trying to get the agenda points in line before she goes but we've had a couple of people who presented at Women Deliver. So it might be interesting also, um, one of our, one of the women-led organizations um, who is from South Sudan um, presented or, or took part uh, with support from Trocare. So she also was there. Um, so it might be interesting to have a couple of people talk about that global meeting, because I think um, not all of us are familiar with it, but it sounds like more and more is happening with women-led organizations and also um, related to GBV, so, uh, and humanitarian settings. So that could be interesting. Um, we had said we would have a couple, an opportunity for a couple AOBs. I see that Astrid is already writing in the chat that Christine Apio, who's our Riga in Nairobi, is going to DRC on the 8th. I know we had heard, and I don't see her online, but I know that our, she's probably not online because she's probably already in DRC, but um, the new sort of GBV person working at WFP was going to go on mission there. So um, I, I don't know, you know, we're always open to feedback on how we run these calls. And I, I really like this, how it just kind of naturally organically happens, but I like when we have a presentation on a country like with a mission, but then that we have other people who have um, been working there for some time or gone on mission to the same place being able to contribute. I think that worked out really nicely. And um, uh, let's let, Astrid, did you wanna say anything else about Christine Apio and her mission? Okay, maybe we lost Astrid. Um, Tony, I wanted to give you a chance to make a comment about your time in the Turkey response, if you wanted to say something. Yes, thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, yeah, just to come in and say thanks so much to the work that Christina and Inigo has been doing for the Turkey response. It was really a great um, experience working with them because as my role on Surge there for three months was to um, find ways to link cross-cutting areas, and support the visibility and amplify the work of, um, you know, subsectors, including GBV and child protection. It was just great to see the innovation that was coming from the GBV team there and finding ways to not only push the sectors to engage more on GBV risk mitigation and prevention, um, but also how they really work to, to um, link across the board with PSCA, um, with AAP uh, and with disability. So that was a really great approach that was 
a lot of it was spearheaded by uh, Christina's team. So definitely great product that's been used. And, and at least for Ocha, when the GBB um, safety audit that included all of those different components and consideration was finalized, um, we tried to push it at the ICCG and also had it highlighted at the HCT as something that needed to be implemented across all sectors. Um, so that was a really great coordination. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. That sounds good. And Shiva, this is another to take note because I know that OCHA has been also having several meetings to look at how to work on inclusion, um, looking at AAP and GBV and disabilities and I think LGBTQTI. Um, I know UNICEF has been working on a package across the, the three clusters and one AOR um, that they support. And uh, I also wrote in the chat that you know, we can have the disabilities person come online. The other thing that came up in this call is innovations. And that was super interesting. So I think um, that is one of our objectives of our GBV AOR strategy. We welcome innovations. Um, and Christine, I think, uh, Christina Palacios, if you can innovate a way to easily do a secondary data review, you would have you'd be have a big fan club behind you. So maybe that's a, a good direction to go because we've been pushing to have more secondary data reviews so that we can, you know, sort of hassle less um, people in terms of uh, doing assessments constantly with, you know, possibly information that's already been found. Um, so and I also want to say a thank you that we have our two uh, co-facilitators of the PARG, Lena and Caroline from NCA and IRC. So, uh, you know, they might be innovating some ideas by listening to all of you as well. Um, any other point that you wanna raise um, or anyone else who was like working in one of these locations and felt like I didn't give you a chance to make a comment? Wow, so we're gonna actually end one or two minutes early. So um, we are gonna have an August call and because um, we know people continue to work and uh, we're trying to send out a monthly update. If you, you should all be on that. Um, and uh, yeah, Shiva, do you have any last AOB for people? No, just if you don't receive our monthly updates or the invitation for the calls, you can go to gvar.net and subscribe there, or you can write to me and I will add you to the list and we will share the recording of this call and the information about the call in August and September shortly. Thank you. And it was great to see some organizations that we don't usually see, like Goal. I think this is the first time I've seen Goal, um, one of the goalies on the call. That's exciting. Um, some of some new UNFPA people like Prudence, and uh, we have someone from UN Women Colombia, Paula Bravo. Please invite your other UN Women colleagues. Um, we also have Paula Ramirez, who's been doing the mindfulness work um, and has been offering those courses uh, through the community of practice. But if you want um, a course on capacity building to improve quality of frontline responders, you can have a conversation with Paula Ramirez, who's here. Um, to do it through your coordination group in your country. Um, and Bedita, who's on here, actually just moved from um, Afghanistan to Ukraine. Um, so some people moving around, but great to see familiar faces and looking forward to seeing some of you on our August call. Oh, yep, that's it. Thanks everyone and have a nice rest of your day. Bye. Bye-bye, thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.